Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar about Apache Spark. Uh, I'm your host today and your moderator. My name is Laura Masterson. I'm the Community Manager here at Typeface. Dean Wampler, who is our Big Data Architect, uh, he's going to be walking you through the findings of a recent survey that we ran uh, with our friends over at Databricks. The survey um, polled over 2,100 developers and uh, just to kind of see some trends and adoption in the Spark community. And so Dean's going to be walking you through the relevance of the data and sharing how uh, you can get more involved in, the Spark, in Spark through workshops and templates and events and such. Um, before I hand things over to Dean, just a few housekeeping items. First of all, the call is being recorded. Um, so if you miss parts of the webinar or if you need to hop off for any reason, uh, you can look for the recording uh, shortly after we wrap up. Hope to share that with you within a day or so at least. Um, also, if you, and we'll also be sending out the slides from Dean's presentation. Um, and lastly, if you have questions throughout the webinar, just insert those into the chat box in the lower left-hand side of your screen. Um, and we'll do our best to answer those as we go. And uh, we'll definitely save some time at the end for Q&A. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand things over to Dean. Dean, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, it's my pleasure. And uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we have one little poll question I'd like you to fill out while I uh, do, do a little rambling here. I'll give you a few seconds, minutes, whatever. Um, and then we should be good to go. So this uh, this webinar, or rather the survey, actually started with a previous survey that we did early last year on job aid adoption. And in that survey, we added questions sort of out of curiosity, you know, how many of you are actually interested in Spark? And we were surprised how many people expressed interest in Spark. So that made us think maybe we should do a follow-up survey about Spark adoption and what people are thinking, what they're discovering and finding as far as how useful it is for their needs and so forth. And um, so what we've done is uh, do the survey, and then today I'm going to go over the results. Uh, there will be a link at the end. And I think we're also going to follow with an email with a link where you can download uh, a more detailed white paper that describes it. Um, so uh, a few other things. Um, I've been doing big data for about three years, four years now actually. And when I got started, I was kind of frustrated at the quality of the tools available. It was mostly in the Hadoop space. And quickly discovered that tools like Spark are really the way that we should be writing big data applications. Uh, the API is much nicer to work with. It exposes the right abstractions. It provides great flexibility for doing the kinds of uh, disparate things that we need to do in big data systems. And so it was really exciting to me when uh, Hadoop uh, vendors like uh, Cloudera and then others uh, uh, recognized that we needed to move beyond MapReduce, and they adopted it. So I'm excited about it. I hope you are too. And based on the results, it looks like most people are. So I want to go ahead and uh, skip the results here. So it looks like um, the majority of you, about 40%, said that you're not using it yet, but you're considering it. And maybe 31% 30, or so are evaluating it. Uh, and about 15 or so said you're actually using it. And then another 12 or so said that you don't have plans to use it. And that's kind of consistent with um, what we've been seeing um, in the, the survey results. So I'll go ahead and close this now. And let's uh, go on to the next topic. Uh, let's see if I click the right button here. There we go. So uh, the distribution of people who responded, as you might imagine, since we're focused on developers as a company, you know, most of our almost three quarters of the respondents are developers. And then we had you know about eight percent who consider themselves data scientists, which is you know an interesting group that we don't typically target in TypeSafe, but obviously people that are very much interested in Spark. Uh, and then you know a few percent of executives, software architects, and other people in the ecosystem. And it represents a pretty wide distribution of industries. The other was the biggest category, um, but we had you know quite a few people in telecommunications, uh, primarily uh, banking, finance, uh, retail, advertising, and so forth. A pretty wide spectrum, kind of reflecting our customer base as well as you know people that. Uh, took the survey who aren't necessarily our customers. So that was, that was also pretty interesting. And when we surveyed these folks and asked them, so what's, you know, what do you think about Spark? Um, you know, about 28% said, uh, you know, what's Spark? I've never heard of it before, don't know anything about it. Or I think in this group also there were some people who just hadn't seen the need to pay any attention to it, so they, they hadn't. And that's sort of consistent with our user group, our user base of uh, type say folks. 
their uh, our customers, you know, uh, range the the gamut from you know, classic IT app development up to big data systems. So this wasn't terribly surprising. Thirty one percent, though, almost a third said they're evaluating Spark now and uh, you know, looking to see if it's really what they need. And then, uh, you know, another group, you know, twenty percent, are actually you know, did the evaluation, decided it's, it's what they want, and so they're deploying it this year in production. And uh, you know, another thirteen percent are expecting to do so next year at the latest. And and you know, a small percentage said, you know, it's not for us. It's not what we need. We we looked at it, but uh, it's um, you know not not the right fit for our needs. So pretty pretty typical there. Uh, we also asked, you know, what kind of things do you want to do with Spark? You know, what, what are you thinking will be its most useful applications for you? And by far the biggest percentage was people who want to process event streams as they arrive in the system. This is one of the big limitations that Spark's predecessor, MapReduce, uh, simply could not do. It was designed for so-called batch mode processing, where you, know, you would maybe aggregate data in your file system. Uh, it would just sort of sit there for hours or maybe a day, whatever, and then you'd run this big batch job that, that processes all of it at once. And that's still very important. There's, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, survey results indicate that people still consider that kind of processing very important. But a lot of people also want to be able to get answers out of that data faster, uh, whether it's handling individual events as they come in, which Spark is not designed to do, or just processing small batches, you know, say after a second or a minute, I want to take the data that just came in, run some analytics over it, and uh, get the information out of it. So that was really uh, one of the important things that people saw as a benefit of Spark. As for the other things, um, you know, 40% or so said that they want to be able to move data between databases and Spark, or you know, pull data out of databases and process it. And we'll see that that comes up in some other results as well quite, quite often. Uh, static reports kind of covers and it's partially, at least, this idea of just running traditional batch jobs over the data to um, you know, generate information. One of the other new features Spark uh, makes relatively easy to do is to uh, interoperate with the data using SQL queries, SQL. There's a Spark SQL module that's getting very popular. Uh, so people need to do that, classic business intelligence sort of stuff. Um, a lot of people are going to continue to use it for ETL processing, you know, up to 60%. ETL being extract, transform, and load, kind of the standard thing that uh, is sort of the, the groundwork for any big data system is, you know, how you're getting data from one source to another, bringing it into a format that's cleaned up and ready to process so that I can extract information from it. And Spark has some really nice general purpose features that make that uh, process relatively straightforward to do. And the flexibility to you put the data where you want it when, when you're done processing it, whether it's in HDFS or uh, the Hadoop distributed file system, that is, or writing back to a database, et cetera. So a lot of uh, variant processing that people needed to do. Uh, and when drilled in a little bit on this event processing uh, step, uh, what we found is that you know, about 70% of the people uh, who responded and who were interested in Spark said that they intend to integrate it into a larger data pipeline. Um, but 65% specifically uh, called out this idea that, you know, we really want to be able to get information from the data faster. We don't want to wait hours for the data to accumulate and then run a batch job. We'd like to study it as quickly as possible as it arrives you know, within some reasonable time frame. And 40% uh, like the idea of being able to you know, automate decision processing as the data comes in. And examples of this might be, uh, you know, uh, improving your recommendation engine. If you're recommending uh, books, if you're on Amazon, or you're recommending movies on Netflix, you'd like to both automate those recommendations, but also uh, make them relevant and stay relevant. You know, constantly training the system as, it, as the new data comes in. So all of that is very important. And the event stream processing system in Spark makes that makes it possible, and it integrates nicely with other features like the machine learning library. So it's pretty straightforward to do whatever you need to do, either in batch mode or uh, streaming. All right. So this next slide goes over um, uh, the specific problem of, of where you can get data into Spark. So Spark is great as a compute engine, but obviously it doesn't live in isolation. You have to hook it up to things. Uh, most of these answers were 
pretty much what we would have expected, more or less. There were a few surprises here, though. Um, a lot of you are using Amazon uh, S3. About 30% uh, said that's going to be a source of data, and even more in the later slide will say that they're actually using Amazon in general. Uh, obviously, a lot of people are interested in Spark in the Hadoop world, so 60% you know, are planning to use it to uh, uh, rather use HDFS as the source of data that's ingested into Spark, you know, just very classic, much the same way that we've always used HDFS. Uh, this number for database access was a little higher than I expected. 46% said they intended to ingest data from databases. And uh, maybe that's not as, as, uh, as high as, or not a surprising number, actually, because certainly in Hadoop ecosystems, people use tools like Scoop to bring data into HDFS for processing. But the one that really surprised me was this number for Apache Spark, 41%. That's emerged as a very common integration with Spark. Uh, ingesting data into Kafka for its you know, resilience capabilities and uh, so forth, and then using that data to feed analytics written in Spark. So we're seeing a lot of deployments of this already, and it's only going to get bigger, we think. So that's, that's a very really interesting number. And then some of the others are kind of what you might expect. There's various services people will use, RESTful services, Bloom and Scoop, and classic tools like that that they'll hook up to Spark to get data into the system for processing. And uh, so that's a, that was pretty interesting, especially the number for Kafka. All right, so going to the next slide. One of the interesting features of Spark is that actually you can run it in several deployment modes. It's not limited to Hadoop. In fact, before it was embraced by the Hadoop community as a replacement for MapReduce, it was not used very often in Hadoop context at all. Uh, the numbers are kind of what we expected, 54% uh, uh, actually deploy in a standalone mode. And what this is, it's really a manually configured cluster. Uh, it's really great when you have a very specific purpose for your cluster. It, it doesn't need to be very dynamic. It doesn't need to have much sophistication in allocating resources like you would need in, say, a multi-user cluster where jobs of various kinds are coming and going all the time. But you might have something dedicated, like it could be a developer integration cluster for the last stages before you're ready to push to um, QA or production. Uh, it might be used for very special purposes, like say you have a dedicated cluster that's ingesting the Twitter firehose and, and doing the initial data cleansing, you know, the initial ETL on that data, and then sending it on to a bigger, more diverse cluster for uh, your data warehousing kind of analytics. So standalone is, is pretty important. It doesn't scale to a great size that well because of the, um, you know, it just doesn't provide features for this kind of resource allocation. Uh, failover is something that takes some work to implement in this deployment mode. But it is a really useful mode for a lot of people. Uh, two years ago, Yarn would have been in the single digits, but because of the, it's been embraced by Hadoop, it's, it's turned into the second biggest way that people deploy Spark applications. I think it will grow and overtake standalone fairly quickly. Um, but uh, you know, right now there aren't that many people who have deployed Spark into their production environments, even though obviously a lot of people are looking at it. Local mode is really a developer mode. It's running on a single machine. But it's actually fine if you're doing some ad hoc uh, analysis of data that fits on your, your workstation. It's a perfectly valid system. But it's not scalable in any way beyond one machine. Uh, you would at least have to go to standalone mode to do that. Mesos is a, a growing way of deploying these kind of systems. We've, we've talked to a lot of people that are interested in using Mesos that don't need the full features of a, a Hadoop cluster, have more specialized concerns. So we'll, I think we're going to see this number grow over time as well. And finally, maybe the, the biggest surprise here is 20% said that they were going to deploy Spark on top of, of Cassandra clusters. Cassandra has a a couple of projects now for integrating with Spark. One of them is uh, officially supported by um, uh, Datastax. So it's a really nice way of integrating the full featured analytics of Spark uh, on top of your existing Cassandra cluster. So, you're, so Cassandra is your durable storage, and Spark is your compute engine. So, uh, so once again, what, what Spark is doing is replacing MapReduce. That's the compute engine piece. You still need some place to store data, either a distributed file system like HDFS or a database like Cassandra. 
Uh, and that's kind of the relationship here between Spark and, and the rest of the big data world. Okay, so obviously all of these things should be driven by business goals uh, in, in very general terms. What are we trying to accomplish? And these numbers are, you know, as you might have guessed, consistent with the previous numbers we've seen. Test batch processing is really about, okay, MapReduce is working, but we would actually need something that works faster. We don't, you know, I've, I've talked to people who have jobs that are running, you know, all night, and it's getting to the point where they can't quite keep up with the data that's accumulated. They don't necessarily need uh, real-time answers, but they do need things to work fast enough that they can uh, get answers more quickly. So this, this is very popular. Almost 80% of the respondents thought this was important. 60%, again, we saw that number, a similar number earlier, that you know, people who are interested in doing event stream processing with, uh, with Spark. Um, I think that uh, the 56% number for doing data queries in real time, this is really like being able to start up a Spark uh, shell and interactively query the data, ask questions of it, analyze it, um, explore it, and so forth. I'm actually surprised this number is as high as it is because it's not something that a lot of people have done, uh, certainly not with MapReduce, but it is true that they've been doing this with tools like Hive and Impala and Drill. So maybe that's not too surprising that they would uh, look to Spark to give them one tool to do all of these things, or at least a subset of this kind of analysis. You know, to be fair, tools like Impala is more mature. Uh, it's, it performs uh, better at this kind of very specific task of real-time queries. But uh, if you need general purpose capabilities that integrates in all these other capabilities, then Spark is a good uh, tool for that as well. I'm glad to see that 55% recognize that developer productivity is, is important. It's a huge benefit of Spark. I've given uh, other talks. Uh, I have one on InfoQ about why Spark has become so popular. And one of the big reasons is that it's just so much more productive to work with these APIs compared to the MapReduce APIs, not only do you get more flexibility in terms of the kind of problems you can address, but you can write your programs with far less code, far more concisely, with a lot of uh, natural operations, that, you, that the, the kind of things that you're thinking about when you're trying to do data work. So I think productivity, this could actually be the thing that really is the biggest win over time compared to these other benefits, even though it's not ranked uh, highest right now. But it's, it's an enormous argument for choosing Spark as the productivity benefit. Okay. Uh, sort of correlated with the previous question is specific features that you're interested in. Uh, these are like the modules in Spark. Uh, the core API is really the, the sort of one-to-one -one replacement for MapReduce. And so anybody who's interested in, in faster batch processing is, is excited about this, so those numbers are consistent. Now, the streaming library is what gives you the capability to process small batches of data. Uh, the way Spark Streaming works is that you basically capture your windows of data over some fixed time frame, and it's up to you. It can be as small as a second or so. It could be you know, minutes, whatever you think is best for the data volume coming in, the, the, the velocity and all that, uh, and how quickly you need to get answers out of that data. And it captures these into little mini batches. So you use the same core API that you would use if you were writing a big batch job, but now you're working on small batches. So you get the same facilities that uh, you have with the other tool, which is great because those are rich facilities. And once you've mastered those, then it's very easy to adapt them to a streaming model. So that's, uh, that's a really nice benefit. Even code reuse is possible here. Uh, I was a little surprised that the machine learning library, MLI, was uh, of such great interest, almost 60%. Uh, certainly machine learning is, is a hot topic. Everybody wants to uh, be as intelligent as possible about how they work with their data. But even then, I was a little surprised this was so high. But that's good news because although it's a relatively small library compared to some other machine learning libraries, like if you're from the Python world, for example, it's rapidly growing, and people are adding new libraries to it all the time. And it does give us the promise of much better scalability for a lot of algorithms that are otherwise hard to scale. Uh, about half of you said that you're interested in, in this integrated query capability through a dialect of SQL. Uh, this is an area that's growing rapidly. It's a relatively new module. But I particularly like mixing uh, SQL statements with the core API, because some things are just so much easier to write in SQL 
and others are just so much more flexible and uh, easy to do in the regular core API. So it's a really nice tool. Uh, and even the last number is a little surprising. Graph algorithms are an important way of thinking about data like social networks and, and you know, traversing those networks to understand the structure of, of the network. But it's not something that uh, we've been able to do very well at large scale. And most of us have written uh, sort of ad hoc implementations to do very specific things uh, rather than the more general case of I'm just going to put all this data in a graph and apply this uh, uh, rich toolkit of, of algorithms to it. GraphX is taking us closer to that goal of being able to really think truly in graph terms in terms of networks of you know, nodes and edges and then process them using uh, the classic algorithms of, of graph traversal and so forth. So this is exciting. Uh, it's another new addition to Spark and uh, I think it's also going to have a, a really beneficial future for us. Well, it may not be too surprising that um, you know, a company like TypeSafe that does a survey on Spark has, happens to hit a lot of people who are interested in Scala. So probably if you survey the entire big data world, the Scala number wouldn't be as high. But it's been uh, my experience over the last few years that uh, toolkits like Spark and predecessors like Scalding that Twitter wrote have really opened people's eyes to how uh, concise uh, big data applications can be when you write them in a functional programming language. And so Scala as a functional JVM language is really a, a, a great tool for this kind of work and tools like Spark make a strong case for Scala. And I've talked to a lot of people who otherwise didn't really care about Scala, didn't see much point in it, but who suddenly got excited about it when they saw the Spark API for Scala. So that's why I think that even though this number is slightly skewed just because of the sample of people we were able to reach, I think it's still not that far off from you know, the real world, uh, the entire space of people that are seeing Scala is a really great tool for big data. The great thing, though, about Spark is it has also a really good Java API. So if you really don't want to pick up a new language, you can use Java. Uh, if you're from the data science world and you prefer working with Python and R, there's a, a very good Python, almost feature complete now with the other APIs. Uh, so that's a really good option for data scientists. And there's a, actually an R API that will become available uh, pretty soon. I think the reason the Python number is 22% and R was sort of an honorable mention is really just because of the space of people we uh, surveyed are mostly developers. And you know, we had, as I said earlier, we had like 8% of the respondents who identified themselves as data scientists. So that's, that's probably a, would really be a bigger number across the industry. And once again, so actually just to back up a little bit, a classic way that we've had to work in the past was that our data scientists would model a, a problem in their favorite languages like R and Python. And then we would just have to turn around and expend developer effort to port it to Java or something so we could run in, in MapReduce. And that was not only really tedious and you know, added a lot of expense and time delay from uh, creating the model to actually deploying it. It just was really an, an awful way to work. And now we're starting to get closer to the model where people can actually write in the language they prefer and then deploy to production. Now with the usual work you have to do for quality assurance and so forth, but it's getting us closer to eliminating unnecessary steps. So that's another exciting thing about Spark. Uh, we ask a, a laundry list of topics about you know, what kind of uh, infrastructure technologies are you using. Uh, it's a little hard to pick out some themes just from the list here, which is shown in order of you know, percentage answers. So I'm just going to hop around a bit and talk about a few of them that are interesting. Uh, no surprise that Amazon EC2 is widely used by people, not just for big data, but for other things. Um, so that was about 50% or so. Uh, Google came in, uh, Google Compute Engine came in at about 8%, Azure at about 6%. Among the Hadoop vendors, about 22% of you said you're using Cloudera. Uh, then about half, 12%, said that you're just using the, the Apache.org builds of Hadoop without commercial support. And close behind was the Hortonworks distribution. And then MapR is, a, is, is on the list as well. Probably more or less representative of uh, the big data space, the Hadoop space in general, how people deploy this. But again, not a, a particularly targeted sample for that space. Uh, and then there's some other technologies. Docker, as we all know, is really popular. A third of you said you're using that. 
Uh, Mesos came in at about 14%, and once again, I think that's a number that's going to grow now that Mesosphere is offering a you know, commercially supported distribution of Mesos with tools. They're also on this list, like Marathon and Kubernetes and Aurora and so forth, that are part of the Mesos ecosystem. Um, oh, I didn't mention uh, Heroku's in there at 10%, so that was just above uh, Google Compute Engine. So anyway, obviously a wide uh, space of uh, technologies in use, all of which you know interoperate with Spark however you need them to. Well, there are some barriers that you're going to encounter with any new technology. Uh, so let's briefly talk about the sort of things that uh, people are uh, you know, cited as issues for them that they'd like to see addressed. And I have to say most of these are being addressed, but nevertheless, this is a technology that started, uh, you know, as a research project about 2009, which was, you know, about the time that Hadoop went mainstream itself. So it hasn't had, you know, the, the baking that Hadoop has had itself yet. But so there's a bunch of stuff here that's kind of growing pains that are rapidly being addressed by the community. If you talk to the folks at Databricks about the, the ecosystem of Spark developers, you know, it's just been a, a hockey stick of growth, people contributing patches, contributing new features, and so forth. Um, well, among our uh, respondents, a lot of people said, look, you know, we just have limited staff experience in this. We don't know much about it. We're you're kind of not sure how to get started. Uh, we need better documentation and that sort of thing. So just a lot of the usual uh, getting started pains were, were reported. Let's see. Next was, uh, you know, the, uh, we had a subset of people who said it, it's just not actually uh, the right fit for us. Uh, once again, TypeShape's customer base is pretty broad, so not everybody is doing big data, and Spark wasn't right for them. They, I'm definitely a big believer in, you know, don't use a tool if it's not, not right for you. And then there was, you know, a class of comments uh, about maturity. Um, some of them, they really fall into two uh, kind of groups, you could say. One is just uh, lack of features. Uh, a good example of this actually is the Spark SQL module. Its dialect of SQL is missing a, a number of things that you would expect in, in just a core SQL implementation. And this is just you know, a reflection of its relative youth. It's only been out about a year or so. But uh, you know, every release, they add new things that have been missing in, in the SQL dialect. So things like that, uh, not, not too surprising, but uh, they are being filled in. Uh, the other issue is, you know, you can always make things more hardened internally. There are a few edge cases that can trigger, you know, occasional out-of-memory errors. Uh, cluster resource usage can always be improved. You know, if resources aren't being used, can we release them back to the you know, cluster manager and things like that? So these are areas where uh, sometimes you run into issues, but for the most part, um, it, it's pretty solid stuff, but you know, I'm, I'm paranoid myself. I always, if I'm going to you know, bet money on, you know, bet my business on something, I'm going to make sure that I test it thoroughly and I'm satisfied that it works for my needs. And uh, that's certainly true here. Uh, so some of the ways in which these issues are being addressed. Uh, one is just a growing list of integrations. Uh, we saw this in Hadoop itself, or all kinds of. Uh, traditional vendors of data tools like visualization tools, uh, databases, and so forth, I uh, came up with uh, ways to integrate with Hadoop. One of my favorite examples of this is uh, SAS, SAS. They've done a lot of work to integrate SAS computation with Hadoop so you can get the best of both worlds. We're now starting to see that happen with Spark. A lot of tools now integrate with Spark directly. Uh, I've mentioned some already that uh, databases like Cassandra are working on you know, very high performance uh, capable drivers so that you can interoperate between them very nicely. So that this is another area of, of lots of growth. Let's see, I think I had something else on this. Yeah, I think that's it. All right. Uh, let's see, the next one. Uh, people uh, expressed a concern that the documentation is a little superficial. They would like to see deeper uh, documentation about internals of Spark, tuning, debugging, uh, that, that sort of thing. More examples of non-trivial uh, scenarios and use cases. All of this is really uh, rapidly improving. The documentation of every release gets much better, more detailed, and uh, certainly this is something that I, I personally have been trying to, to do myself. I'll, I'll even point you to a tutorial I wrote for Spark uh, towards the end of the talk. Although I have to say, just to be honest, it is an introductory tutorial, so it's not necessarily a deep tutorial. But uh, this is an area where a lot of us are working to uh, 
you know, spread the knowledge and make uh, Spark easier to use for everybody for both the trivial to the profound to the non-trivial kind of scenarios. And a lot of these areas where features need to be fleshed out, that's happening rapidly, especially in the newer modules like Spark SQL and GraphX and, and the machine learning library. And a lot of engineering work is going on internally. In fact, we're involved in one project ourselves to make things more robust in various possible failure scenarios. OK, so that kind of covers uh, the, the tutorial. I wanted to finish uh, with a few notes about how you can learn more about Spark and where to go for more information. Uh, first, I wanted to start with uh, just to mention some conferences and user groups that you might investigate uh, if you want to learn more. Of course, uh, Strata is uh, Strata plus the Dupe world is kind of the definitive big data conference these days. Um, I'm actually speaking at both the San Jose and London events, so uh, if you're there, please come hi, uh, come say hello. But, but you'll hear a lot about Spark. There's some uh, all-day tutorials in Spark and, and other workshops, as well as just regular talks. So check that out. Uh, Type Safe Zone Scala Days conference is coming up uh, both in March in San Francisco and in Amsterdam in June. Uh, there, I'll be speaking about Spark there, uh, and there'll be other talks about people using Spark in, in the big data context as well. Uh, there's a new conference. Uh, I think last year was the first year in San Francisco called Scala by the Bay. I'm actually keynoting at this one. Uh, a really good a technical conference on Scala in general with some specific talks and big data. But it's immediately followed by uh, a conference called Big Data Scala that focuses in on uh, Scala as a tool for big data applications. So I hope that you'll uh, uh, take advantage of that. And then lastly, uh, Databricks uh, sponsors the um, uh, standard, uh, these sort of the official conferences for Spark. There's a new one in New York this year called Spark Summit East. That'll be in March. And then the, uh, the standard conference has gone on for a few years now in San Francisco will be uh, coming up in June. And if you search, uh, if you go to this link on meetup, spark.meetup.com, you'll actually see a list of all the Spark user groups around the country. And uh, I do encourage you to get involved. Uh, I'm, I'm looking for people to speak at mine in Chicago. So uh, you know, please uh, get involved that way as well. And meetups, I'm, I'm a big believer in meetups because they're a great way to meet other people and learn stuff. You know, a couple hours a month is all it really takes uh, to at least attend a meetup. So I do give those a shot. And finally, a few resources to, uh, you know, for further information to explore things uh, on your own. Uh, this is the Spark Workshop uh, self-study that uh, it's sort of a tutorial that I wrote. It's available through our activator system. And by the way, if you would like to write some of those tutorials for Spark users, I strongly encourage you to submit them as templates to our activator uh, portal. It's a great way for people to browse for sample applications, not only in the big data world, but for Akka and Clay and other tools. Uh, so I do consider submitting examples there. Uh, if you want a, you know, an introduction to Spark, something that you can do on your own on a laptop, then check out my workshop at this link, uh, typesafe.com activator template Spark workshop. Uh, There's a companion white paper that uh, goes with this uh, a uh, webinar that provides some more details than I was able to give you here. You can get to that at uh, Bitly Spark Report 2015. And then finally, you know, please check out TypeSafe.com for other uh, information about our products and services around Spark. We're, you know, we're sort of expanding those and, and hope to provide a you know, comprehensive suite of, of options for people very soon. OK, that's, uh, that's all I had to say. Uh, now I'll take some questions. I see we have a few. All right. Yeah. So the first question. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Laura. Oh no, you go. You go for it. Okay. Um, this, uh, first one is just a general question uh, for somebody who doesn't know Spark well. You know, is it a web framework, a database framework, et cetera? So let me recap something that I said. I actually noticed this question earlier and threw in a comment. But you can think of there's really two pieces two core pieces you need in any data system. One is a way to store data, and the other is a way to actually do some sort of computation over it, you know, ask questions of it, uh, process it, and whatever. Uh, Spark is very much that processing piece that can take data that's stored in various places, 
do some analytics on it, some transformations on it, whatever you need done, and then write it back to durable storage. So it's not a database. Uh, it's more like the SQL part of a database, but you still integrate it with other storage tools like the Hadoop file system or Cassandra or, or whatever. S3 can be used, that sort of thing, S3 and Amazon. Okay, another question was, how much productivity increase do the developers report expect? Uh, I mentioned the Spark talk that I have on InfoQ, a uh, shameless plug. And I actually talk about this in that talk, and I show an example of doing an algorithm called the inverted index, which is sort of a classic baseline algorithm for search engines and so forth. And it's about, I think it's like 100 lines of, of a tedious Java code. So, you know, it was it's at least many hours of work plus very careful testing because there's so much tedious bit twiddling in this example that, you know, just to make sure it's actually, you know, correct. And then I showed the Spark version, and that one uh, is actually even a more sophisticated implementation, and it took me 30 minutes to write it, uh, and I, it was almost, you know, I, I don't think there were any bugs in it when I actually uh, started running tests on it because it's, a, it's, it's hard to describe verbally without showing examples, and I encourage you to look at that example, but, um, the, the way the API is structured, there's no low-level bit twiddling. There's just high-level thinking about how you know step-by-step -step transformation of data to get from the input to the output I want. Uh, and it's very easy to do this conceptually in your mind and then take that conceptual view and translate it into code. So uh, it, it's hard to quantify the productivity improvement, but it's easy in order of magnitude. The number of bugs that will probably drop by an order of magnitude. It's much easier to write stuff, test it locally, which you can't do with MapReduce very easily at all. Uh, you know, tweak it, refine it, deploy it, let it run, and then go back and tweak and refine, redeploy, and so forth. So I think it's extremely disruptive in that way, but it, it's something that you have to experience more than you know, something that you can quantify with numbers. And I think it's true for whichever API you pick, although I do recommend like the Scholar or Python APIs for very concise work. But um, compared to MapReduce, it's incredible. All right. Um, this is about productivity. Uh, someone asked if I could compare it to Gear Pump. Unfortunately, I don't know anything about Gear Pump, so I don't really have anything to say there. Uh, but uh, yeah, hopefully somebody else can answer that. On there's, a pretty, the there's a pretty in-depth there's a pretty in-depth blog post on TypeSafe.com um, that goes into more detail on Gear Pump. I can share that in the chat box. Okay. Yeah, so check the chat box for some more information there. Uh, so a very interesting question someone asked, what about using ACA clustering as a way of clustering Spark as opposed to, say, standalone mode or even Mesos? And to be quite honest, we're, we're looking at that as a very distinct possibility. There are some technical features you would want in a uh, clustering solution for Spark that uh, ACA clustering doesn't yet have. but. Uh, I definitely am interested in that idea. It's it's not there yet, but we think that we can do it. Um, what about running R over Spark? There there is a toolkit called Spark R, and I think that's the one that has evolved into the Spark API. It, interesting backstory: that API was supposed to be released in the December release of Spark version 1.2, and I think there were some. It turned out there were some last-minute license issues with some of the libraries they were using, so they had to delay it. It's effectively done but they're cleaning up some license issues so they can deploy it as part of the Apache project. But I haven't had a chance to play with it myself. I'm not a Spark pro or rather an R programmer, but um, I think it's designed to be feature complete. So anything you can do with the other APIs, you should be able to do with the R API. Someone asked, is there a killer app using Apache Spark? Um, that's always, you know, I, I guess it depends on what industry you're in as to what you consider killer. But a, a great one that I like to, uh, to offer as an example, and this is one that I discuss when I teach Spark. Shameless plug, we also teach, uh, do training on Spark. Uh, no, it's, it's a very classic scenario, especially for those of you who are using Hive and Hadoop. And just a little background for those of you who don't know Hive. Uh, Hive is the very first tool that let you do SQL-style queries on top of data in the Hadoop file system. It's invented by Facebook. and it, in my opinion, it's one of the reasons that Hadoop became so popular because it made it accessible to a, just a wide class of data analysts who were, were never going to you know, bother learning Java or whatever. 
One of the ways that you can use Hive is to uh, partition your data by things where you typically, they typically correspond to where clauses. Great example is log data. You ingest uh, log data from your servers around your uh, environment, and you almost always write queries like, you know, select stuff, you know, where the date was this date or the hour was this hour, that kind of thing. If you partition the data by these timestamps, just say year, then month, then day, Hive is smart enough to know, well, I don't need to search all 100 terabytes of log data or whatever I have. I know that I just need to search this part of the data where that happens to have the records for that you know, time range. So back to Spark, a great scenario is let Spark in real time ingest the events from my logs as they're coming in and then create these partitions in Hive. There's a, part of the SQL API is the ability to interoperate with Hive. So I can write Hive queries, including queries, uh, DDL kind of statements that create the partitions in my Hive table. I write the data with Spark, and then you know, the very next time that somebody with you know, Hive or Impala runs a query over that data, they'll see this log data you know, in near real time. That's one of my favorite practical examples, and it goes back to a lot of the work I did when I was uh, doing Hadoop consulting before Spark was available, so working with Hive. So, but, but probably if people really want a true uh, killer app, so to speak, it's probably going to be one of the machine learning things that you could do combined with Spark streaming mixed in with SQL queries. But this is one of my favorite practical examples. It's mundane, but it's really important for a lot of people. Okay. Uh, let's see a few more here. Um, someone was asking about a paper. I'll have to come back to that. I'll, I'll probably follow up with uh, some Twitter postings about some of the questions that I really can't answer here. But uh, so, just to clarify, another a question here. So, Spark is a you could call it a replacement or counterpart to MapReduce. It's not replacing all of Hadoop. It's only replacing that compute engine piece. And it, and because of Yarn which gives us the ability to run different compute engines inside a Hadoop cluster and, and nicely coordinate resource allocation. We can take MapReduce jobs, run them side by side with Spark jobs. If we want to replace the MapReduce jobs with Spark equivalents, we can do that. So that's the piece that we're talking about when we talk about Spark in the context of Hadoop. Uh, someone asked about RabbitMQ integration. There, there is some work being done. I, I believe there might even be a, an API uh, that's analogous to the API for talking to Kafka, where you can you know, uh, query topics in your message queue, and I believe RabbitMQ is one of those. I don't know much about that, though, but certainly if you start snooping around, you should be able to find one. Uh, the streaming uh, API does come with some connectors already built in for uh, things like uh, sockets and uh, Kafka and so forth. Even the Twitter Firehose, you can connect to a Twitter stream if you just have a, like a developer uh, login and password. So there's a bunch of stuff that's already in there, and it's not difficult to write your own connectors if you uh, if you need something for uh, like a message queue that isn't supported yet. Okay, let's see. Maybe uh, three or four more questions, and then it'll probably be a good time to stop. Um, an interesting question here is, what about traditional databases? You know, say MySQL or whatever. It doesn't make sense to connect those to uh, to Spark. And I think the answer probably is yes. You'll just need to figure out how, what's the right way to load queries to the database. Probably wouldn't do streaming so much, but certainly uh, you could use Scoop, uh, the classic Hadoop tool, and that's spelled S Q O O P to pull data out of Hadoop and put it into HDFS. <clears throat> I'm sorry, pull data out of a database and put it into HDFS. So in that sense, Spark wouldn't even be involved. Um, more directly, um, you should be able to write a connector that can – there is actually uh, JDBC interfaces as well. So you should be able to write JDBC queries to a database if you want to. Uh, have to you'll just have to think about the mechanics of when. Uh, is it more of a streaming model or is it something that's more of a batch mode job? but it, it can be done. Pretty much a lot of the questions you might have about can I do X with Spark, the answer, if it's something that you could have done with MapReduce, the answer is just yes. Uh, in, in fact, uh, Spark uses the IO libraries that are part of the MapReduce code base. So all of those things like working with sequence files and Parquet and, uh, and other things, that just comes for free. 
Uh, what's interesting, though, is these new scenarios like streaming, like uh, math, uh, the uh, MLI for machine learning, uh, and those kinds of things. Okay. Um, someone asked about the background of the survey. Um, we basically distributed it to all of our customers, uh, people that we uh, knew that maybe weren't necessarily customers that we'd interacted with, and then we had some other outside media uh, who, who also you know, had like a, a databases of developers to submit the, uh, the survey to their, their users. So I, don't, I think we actually did get a pretty good sampling of the developer world. There were over 2,000 respondents. Uh, total, and about a quarter of those were, uh, you know, answered detailed questions about Spark. But um, whether it was truly a sample of the big data world, it's probably not quite correct, but it was certainly a, a good sample of the developer world. Okay, uh, let's see. I'm, there's a lot of questions. I'm just kind of paging through and looking at the ones that, uh, that I can easily answer here. Uh, there's an interesting question about using like time series data and um, uh, geospatial data in the system. Um, that's not something I've done myself, so I don't know if um, I don't think that the, like the machine learning library, for example, has anything built in for uh, geospatial uh, data. It is really flexible, though. It's pretty easy to use your own classes that represent a schema of data and just integrate them right into uh, your Spark job. So in general, it should be fairly easy. And I bet if you search hard enough on the interwebs, you can probably find examples of where people are doing this already. But uh, as of this moment, I don't think there's anything built into Spark specifically for those kind of problems. Uh, someone asked about SAMHSA. I'm not that familiar with SAMHSA. I think they're trying to cover the same space. Another example would be uh, uh, Tez, which is now the engine that's behind the latest release of Hive, for example, uh, offering similar performance improvements, more flexibility for developers, but not quite the market share. I, I think an important thing you have to always ask yourself is, even if right now one tool is better than another, if it looks like inevitably uh, the, the less superior tool is going to win in the market, you kind of have to go with it anyway, in part because enough people will get involved in the project to make it as best as possible, whereas you know, an obscure project that could technically be better just won't get the attention to uh, keep up in the long term. So unfortunately, I think that's going to be true uh, with a lot of you know, very good alternatives to MapReduce that just uh, will probably end up falling by the wayside because just you know, the, the usual ways that technology is driven by marketing just as much as technical competence. Someone asked about fault tolerance. So this is an area where uh, work is being done, especially in streaming. Uh, in general, uh, Spark is, um, you know, relies a lot on clustering tools uh, like your, your Mesos and, and Yarn to, to manage failed processes. Uh, the standalone mode has a server process that you start yourself and then slay processes. And there is a way you can use Zookeeper to build uh, failover and, and redundant uh, masters. But um, yeah, that's much more of a hand-held uh, sort of problem. In, in general, um, the story is, once again, very similar to this story from MapReduce. It relies on a lot of external tools to help you get the resiliency you need while focusing on what it can do internally to prevent data loss. Um, I won't go into a lot more detail than that. There are some interesting things built into Spark to prevent data loss in the event of, say, a process failure. Uh, and I'll just refer you to some other documentation to look at that. All right, I think I'll take one more question, and then it's probably a good time to stop. Um, let's see, this is a long one I'm reading here. I think I've actually already answered that one, in fact. Uh, but I will finish with this uh, particular interesting one, and that is actually two. One is quick. What about uh, Mahout? Mahout is a popular library in Hadoop for machine learning. Uh, my understanding is that they have stopped accepting uh, new features for or new algorithms for MapReduce, and they're now focusing on implementing everything on top of Spark. So that, that's really good news because they have, for example, a lot of really good clustering algorithms that. Uh, the Spark machine learning library doesn't have at this time. So uh, you'll ha I haven't kept up with what's going on exactly there, but if you follow uh, the Mahu community, I think you, you can pretty quickly find out what they're up to. And this last one is, what about uh, reactive streams? 
uh, people are using uh, this new model of streaming that tries to bake in back pressure to avoid buffer overflows and other problems. Um, we've implemented uh, this reactive stream uh, standard in ACA called ACA Streams. You can find them in RxJava, that, uh, the, the big project that uh, Netflix has worked on. This is one of the things we're actually working on to make uh, Spark Streaming more resilient, is helping them uh, better behave in a reactive way, meaning supporting back pressure so you don't overwhelm their Spark processes with data flow. But right now, it's, it's a bit of a, lots of moving parts and it's not quite there yet, but we hope to help make this a, a, an area of greater uh, robustness in Spark Streaming by actually using reactive streams. Okay, I think I'll stop there. I really appreciate your time, um, and I hope you found this valuable. Uh, do follow up with us if you are interested in more. Uh, check out our resources, our my Spark workshop, our training options, uh, and so forth. And uh, I hope you all enjoy your journey with Spark. Once again, thank you very much. Yep, thank you, Dean. Um, and just to end, on one final note, I'm sharing for a second time the link to the survey. So if you want to take a look at any of these findings, in more detail, um, you can download the survey there. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning of our call, uh, the Dean's webinar was recorded. We're going to be sharing a link to the recording along with um, his slides shortly. Um, if you have any questions for us, please feel free to reach out. Um, you can send me an email directly at laura.masterson at typesafe.com. And uh, we hope to see you on future webinars. Thanks so much for joining us.